you just begin by like introducing kind of yourself and your official title with your organization? Yeah, my name is Keenan Crow. Uh, I use they and them pronouns. I'm the director of policy and advocacy for uh, One Iowa, which is a statewide LGBTQ advocacy organization. And for many members of our congregation, I know you came and spoke with us last year, and so we appreciate that ongoing conversation that we've had with you. Um, as we're talking this month really around justice and what it means for us as a congregation to truly be justice-seeking, uh, we focused on four different areas, um, one for each Sunday for the month of June, to really be focusing on what we think are the key issues of our congregation. And so this Sunday we're talking about LGBTQ um, TQ e equality and what that really means for us. And so you know, I think the first question, just for many of us in the congregation, we have spent months really focusing on the legislative session. Um, and certainly not the legislation um, we had hoped for um, and prayed for. And so I guess the first question is, um, knowing how difficult that was, like what really do you see as the most challenging obstacle to really ending, you know, what many of us consider to be really this persecution um, of the LGBTQ community? Yeah. Um... That's hard because there's a lot of interrelated things that are working together, right? But I mean, one of the main things is ignorance, um, because we know that the largest predictor of someone supporting LGBTQ rights is having an LGBTQ person in their life. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that leads me to believe that there's just, um, especially among folks that are passing this legislation, they don't have those Kind of cogent counter examples in their lives and so you know when when we process information the way the human brain works is we kind of we, we go and cross check it against like everything else that we believe right and um and if it seems to comport then we we absorb that and if it doesn't then we get into this weird state called cognitive dissonance and we have to do something to to resolve that dissonance one way or another um when you have an lgbtq person in your life it creates this this counter example effect and so, you know, if you know that that Bob down the street, um, you grill with him every Sunday and uh, and he's a good guy and, and he happens to be trans, um, you know, but you're, you're friends and, and you hear a new piece of information, and then you go and you think in, in your brain like, well, that doesn't sound like Bob, right? Mm, right. <laughs> and, then you, and then you go, well, obviously that piece of information is wrong. I'm just going to reject it. But if you don't have that, um kind of framework to work with then any of those things seem plausible and then you're really only relying on your own biases to kind of counter check that info and that's where we get into some problems because if you've already got kind of that um, cognitive infrastructure <laughs> created to accommodate those biases and you find another piece of information that, that comports with them, um, then that's just going to uh, add to the structure rather than, than being seriously critically examined. So I do think that, that a large portion of it is, um, is ignorance. Obviously there is, there's malice out there as well, but I think if you were to kind of tinker inside people's heads, I, I guess I, my hope is that we would find more ignorance than malice. <laughs> mm -hmm. So can, for those of us not familiar with One Iowa, what specifically does your organization do, you know, again, really to combat this, this wave of apathy and malice um, towards the LGBTQ community? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, a few things. Obviously, my role is... Um, direct lobbying, organizing, et cetera, um, along with um, Maddie Leahy on the organizing team, we uh, do a lot of the kind of more traditional uh, work that you might expect when it comes to um, political and advocacy type activities. Uh, but that's definitely not the entirety of it. Um, actually, most of our education or most of our organization is directed toward uh, education efforts. And so that looks like going and, um, you know, doing the kind of sessions that we had with y'all, um, but also with, you know, workplaces, with um, state and federal agencies, basically with anybody that'll have us. <laughs> um, uh, and I normally get brought in for, for hostile audiences or folks that um, may be 
um, averse to this information. Um, you know, there's a, a, very, a very big difference between a training that people voluntarily attend and, and a training that people <laughs> involuntarily attend. And you get sure. Audiences um, out of that. But I do think that it's important to hit both of those audiences. And I do think that it's important um, that we take the hard questions on uh, because I have no uh concerns that if i get one of those hard questions that i somehow can't answer it or that uh, someone else's answer is better i know that our position is is correct and that um i'm confident that if those questions are out there that we can answer them sufficiently hmm. if you had a magic wand or the power to change things what is what's one thing that you personally would do to really re bring about this equality for the LGBTQ community. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, again, multi-layered, but if I had a magic wand, it would probably just be um, for <laughs> for human beings to not fear things that are, are different, uh, because I think that's really where a lot of this comes from. Um, or to, uh, I guess, alternatively, not to equate rarity with disorder or um disparagement because some things are are infrequent but that doesn't necessarily mean they're abnormal um mm -hmm. you know uh, for those of you who play poker out there <laughs> getting a straight flush is is certainly uh rare it's it's infrequent but it's not a, like an abnormal thing it's not like you get um like an uno card in there right like that's <laughs> that would okay. that would be something that 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 wouldn't um comport with the game uh but when we're talking about lgbtq people uh in terms of this poker analogy i mean they're all uh in the deck so to speak they're they're to be expected mm -hmm. um and so i think people do get off on this weird tangent of just because something is rare means it's bad or just because something is infrequent that makes it somehow less than or you know uh, uh something to be feared etc um and I, I that's obviously you know not the case <laughs> okay well, shifting from you to us what's what's one piece of advice what's one thing really that you would hope our congregation could do as a congregation to really support this um, effort towards more LGBTQ equality? Yeah, um, so it's, this is always a tricky question because I, um, I'm always kind of out of the loop when it comes to what resources and, and things that people have available or what they actually want to do. So mm -hmm. my, my advice to anybody that wants to help with any issue is, is number one, um, figure out who's doing the thing, right? You, you figure that out. Uh, <laughs> I'm on. So uh, you've gotten to that step. And then number two, kind of evaluate what resources you have and then see how you could use those resources to help out. So a few of the things that, um, that tend to be helpful are obviously showing up uh, to LGBTQ uh, events, rallies, et cetera. Um, if you can uh, get folks in the room, that tends to help us out uh, quite a bit. Um, there's the whole time, talent, and treasure um, mm -hmm. kind of trichotomy, I guess you would call it, of, um, you know, what, whatever you have uh, to put towards something, that's what you should put towards something. Some people are, um, have a lot of free time on their hands. And obviously you could use that to volunteer. You could use that to write letters to the editor. You could use that to contact your legislators. You could use that to run for office. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities there. Uh, talent wise, if you are great at graphic design or video editing, or, um, there's just some skill that, um, an LGBTQ organization around you could use, you know, that's the talent piece. And then obviously if you've got uh, spare uh, monetary resources or monetary resources that you could direct towards a cause, that's always very helpful as well. So one of those three time, talent or treasure or a combination of, of them, um, you know, th those things are always helpful. Great. My final question for you is um, we've been on this journey as a congregation to really work on our vision and be thinking about who we want to be and who we want to live into in becoming. 
And so part of our identity is really being justice seeking. And so I think the question um, that we close with is, what does justice look like in the area of LGBTQ equality? Yeah, um, that seems like an easy question. <laughs> uh, but justice, I think, is, is very elusive um, in a number of ways. I guess if I had to try to distill it to like a single sentence, it would be that LGBTQ people could live their lives in the same, I don't want to say the same way, but with the same kind of freedom and autonomy mm -hmm. as non-LGBTQ people. Maybe, maybe they don't want to do the same things. Maybe they don't want to live their lives in the same way, but they have the same opportunities, the same kind of social mobility, the same uh, ability to, um, you know, live, work, provide for their families, get an education, you know, all those things that a lot of folks take for granted, um, but that are, are kind of difficult to accomplish, that they're not experiencing this kind of invidious discrimination all the time, that they don't have chronic health issues from the stress placed on them by this system, right? Like, if we could get to the point where um, LGBTQ people are, are just not treated as somehow sick, um, and we had a society in which um, we could all kind of live our lives in, in that way, um, and that might, uh, <laughs> to be fair, contain some very dramatic uh, both social and economic overhauls, uh, mm. because the economic system is, is just as important um, as the social policies are. I think sometimes that gets maybe overlooked even by LGBTQ organizations. But, um, you know, if you look at the, at the kind of economic conditions that LGBTQ people are experiencing, that's obviously part of it as well. And obviously wealth inequality is part of it as well. And so, you know, justice really looks like everybody getting the chance to live their lives as they see fit, obviously, as long as they are not harming <laughs> others um, in the wake. And um, the current economic system certainly does a lot of harm to others as well. Hmm. It sounds like that there is, there's some intersectionality to what you're talking about, that it's not just so. a, a religious issue, like you say, or a social issue, but there's economic there's mental health um which we've certainly discussed as well so yes okay yeah absolutely it's it's kind of an all-encompassing thing i don't think we get to you know equality and justice without taking kind of a holistic look of hmm. how our society and how our communities um look and and operate they've been designed to benefit a very specific group of people to the detriment of basically everybody else but in particular <laughs> um, some some marginalized groups that really, really um, are slated for um, desperately poor treatment. Well, Keenan Crow, I really appreciate your time. Thank you again. And thank you for the work that you do with One Iowa and for the LGBTQ community. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for all your work as well. Mm -hmm.